This tutorial will teach you how to make this green brush cane, and as a bonus at the end, how to apply it to a pen barrel to make a pen similar to this one. Today we're going to make a cane that imitates a brush stroke of oil paint. Different sections of the cane will look different, so you can take cuts through different sections to get different looking strokes, and then apply those on top as a surface effect, or you can take sections of the cane and assemble them to create a new cane that looks like it was made with different brush strokes. First, I'm going to create the base blend. I went with the dark green, dulled a little bit by adding the red, and then just a little bit of blue to add some interest. A common way of mixing colors is to use cutters to get a certain number of parts of each color, but when I'm mixing larger amounts like this, I prefer to use my small scale, like you see here. My mix is eight parts green, one part cadmium red, and one part cobalt blue. I'm using Primo clay, so if you don't like my color or you're using a different brand of clay, go ahead and pick a different color to make. I'm adding these stripes of white, black, and blue because I want the cane to imitate actual paint. The white and black provide the appearance of bumps in the paint, kind of like there's texture as you lay it down with a brush, and the occasional blued stripes leave the impression of a not completely mixed color. If you used a different base color, you may want to use something other than blue, but I recommend still using black and white. Later in this video, I'll show you how I achieved the other part of my goal with this cane, which was a cane that isn't really like other canes, it doesn't look like it's the same brush stroke all the way through, since of course real brush strokes aren't identical all the way through either. The blue adds some color variation. Remember, we had some blue in this original mix. If you aren't using my exact mix, think about what additional colors you added and decide which of those you want to look kind of a little extra streaky in your final cane. Neatness really doesn't matter here. Feel free to cut them thick or thin, sloppy or not. Honestly, neatness doesn't matter for most of this cane. There's not any rules you have to follow here. The only thing that really matters is that everywhere you have a black, which is a shadow, you have a white on the same side of that black to create a highlight. So if you have le white on the left of the black, then you should always have white on the left of the black. to flatten this before putting it in the pasta machine. While it's only actually double thickness, so it's not like it's going to damage the machine, the stripes make the sheet not a consistent thickness and makes it a bit harder to manage. Flatting it just that bit before putting it in makes it easier. Don't worry if you're distorting it at all. Frankly, at any point in this process, all of that adds the kind of variation that we're looking for to imitate a natural look. I'm using a pasta machine here to make it easier, but you could do the whole thing with a roller too. It would just take a little bit longer. You don't have to blend a certain number of times. Blend until it looks good. For me, I think I did about 11 or 12 blends on this one. I found it useful to blend with the stripes facing out so I could see my progress. When you're done, trim the sides if they're messy and the color isn't great. And then after that, just slice and stack. Same thing as before, precision doesn't really matter. You can see here how my lines aren't really exactly square and my stripes aren't lining up. That's all perfectly fine. It'll all work out at the end. It's 
time to reduce it to a more manageable size and shape. Precision doesn't matter. Exact size and shape don't matter. You just want something basically a handleable size. If you made a larger cane like I did, you might want to cut it in half and just make the next part with half the cane. You can always come back and use the other half to make another one. Next up, we're gonna create the actual brush cane. You wanna use about as much translucent as you have in your green cane. I use my scale to measure it, but you can also eyeball it. Half is gonna go on the top, half is gonna go on the bottom. It will look like we have a lot of wasted translucent in the final cane, but I prefer it this way, because that way when you have those long strips that come out, they don't end right there and there's a little bit more grace to the cane, but you can give it a try either way. It's worth experimenting. In earlier versions of this cane, my translucent was exactly the same size, sort of width and height around the green cane. I found that didn't work as well because the translucent was moving at a different pace than the green and the distortions I was applying was kind of making all of that worse. So I found that if I start with the translucent a little bit broader than the green and kind of pull it up on the sides, it prevents some of that distortion. Definitely experiment with your own though. Once you get both sides on, squeeze the cane together and then you're ready to start distorting. So this is a tool that I'm using here. It's a fruit and vegetable wavy chopper knife, according to Amazon. I like it because those sort of flutes, the fact that it's not flat, makes it make much more interesting patterns as it's going through the clay instead of the straight blades. I did a lot of these with straight blades and they just didn't have the variation that I was looking for. One of the things is also that when you're doing the chops, you're not sitting here doing just straight across chops. You wanna be doing them at all sorts of angles and even sometimes not cutting the whole way across. You may find little bits falling off, just squish them back on somewhere. Doesn't really matter where. I wanna pause the video moment here to show why I'm doing this. The whole point of all this chopping and slicing with a wavy blade is to produce a cane that has strokes and texture through it like a brush does, but also that looks different depending on where you end up cutting that cane at the end. Brush strokes don't all look the same each time you make them and I wanted my cane to be able to imitate that look different in different sections so I could use slices from those different sections and have a more natural look. Okay, let's get back to it. After each time you do the slicing, reform your cane. It's okay if it changes shape. It's okay if it gets wider or taller. That adds to the variation because it means the space between the waves changes. Similar to before, precision and neatness don't matter here. When you're working with the clay, you really want to try to keep the translucent mostly about the same depth across the whole cane. If it gets too thin or too thick in parts, it can make that particular section of the cane a lot less usable because there's either too little green or way too little translucent. Remember that our goal here is not to have it look the same all the way across. So it's good when things look different on different ends. You can see here it's starting to get bigger and flatter. Rather than trying to reform it into its original shape, I'm just running with it. it. Means I have a few more options in my cuts. I can cut partially across, I can cut all the way across, I can cut at an angle.
you're curious how it's going and want to know if you can stop or not, you can always stop, take a slice, and take a look. Remember that the final cane is going to be a lot longer, which will make it a little less obvious, a little less choppy. Right here you can see me putting some translucent on some of the places where it's just gotten a little too thin. If you don't, your paint is right up at the end and it looks kind of blunt and weird and unnatural. I prefer to make sure that the translucent doesn't get too thin anywhere. I'm going to pause right here and show you a very important thing that's going on. You'll notice the cane is not really uniformly distributed when you cut through. I have a lot more of my base color, my green in this case, on the two ends, and the translucent tends to bunch in the middle. If you were to just turn that into your final cane, you would get a cane that looks like this one. You can see how the middle of this slice has more translucent and the ends have more of the green on them. That isn't the effect I was going for because that's not really what most brush strokes look like. If it's what you want, then great, but it wasn't what I wanted. So first step to avoid that, trim a little bit of the extra color on the ends. Get it so you're having translucent at both ends. You can lift it up and check. You want to see that across the top and the bottom, you've got a pretty nice strand of translucent. Slice until you get to that point. Yep, that'll do. Then, slice down the middle. Right as I started doing that, I realized, hang on, I could use my wavy cutter for this. So I went back and used the wavy cutter on the two ends and the wavy cutter to cut across the middle. I'm not sure how much difference it makes, but I'm all for anything that creates more variation and less reliability in this cane. So simply slice down the middle, switch to the top and the bottom, reform your cane and you're good to go. While you want the two sides to approximately match up, it doesn't need to be perfect, just not off by tons. You can do a few more passes across with the wavy cutter, just to make sure that center cut line isn't something that stays true the whole way through the piece and creates a common element that can distract people. Next, reduce the cane. You could make any shape out of this, but in this one, since I'm going after brush stroke, what I really want is something that is long and thin. You can see even on the sides how the cane is very different at different points. And now when we slice it, you can see the effect of that rearrangement of cutting in the middle and swapping the two ends. Our middle is longer, our ends are a little bit shorter, and it looks a lot more like a brush stroke. You can also see the effect of the color variations in there. It's a lot less interesting when you just have a flat color. I definitely don't recommend skipping out on the stripes. Especially when the cane is reduced small, they become very subtle, but they're always there. You can also see here, 
my goal of having each piece look just slightly different works. Compare across the bottoms. You can see they're related, but they aren't identical, and that was my goal. Here's another view of the cane at three different sizes. Here's some sample projects I've made with both the green and the rainbow cane. I made the bowl at the top left, I made the bowl at the top right with the rainbow cane, and today's tutorial is going to look at how you make the pen in the bottom. For this pen, I did use a kit, the Spartan Click Pen Kit from Penn State Industries, but you can do this with a Bic pen as well. I have another video up on how to cover a Bic pen and sand it and make it look awesome, but I won't be covering that in this specific tutorial. I'll put a link to that video in the description below. Regardless of what you're using, cover the barrel with liquid clay. It helps everything stick better. The background of the pen is very simple. Here I'm using Primo White Pearl. By tearing off the pieces, randomly turning them around, squishing them, laying them, you're creating essentially a ragged mica shift effect. Mica shift is a technique where you're creating essentially ghost images that look a little textured, a little patterned, and metallic or pearl clay. It fools the eye and catches your attention in a way you don't expect. This is a pretty just kind of random mica shift where we're just slapping pieces on, but of course you can do this with stamps and all sorts of much more complicated things. If you're interested, search on YouTube and look at some other tutorials on mica shift. Same as before, precision and neatness don't matter. Just don't leave any places that are just all one piece without any little pieces stuck to it, because the idea is to create a very subtle, pearly, very... We'll skip ahead, this takes a while. You want the outside to be about uniform thickness, but it doesn't have to be perfect because we're going to roll it later. Just don't have any areas that are significantly higher than others or areas that are extremely low. Pay close attention to the ends. It's very easy to build up tons of clay around the middle and very hard then to build up the ends of your barrels to have enough clay there to have the right height. Extra clay at the end of the barrel will distribute itself around the pen or roll off at the end and you can trim it. So don't worry too much about it. I tend to make the ends of my barrels a little bit thicker than the middle for that reason. When you think you've done a bunch, flatten it and if you're using a pen kit, you want to check against the bushings. If that doesn't make any sense to you, don't worry about it. You can learn about it if you ever decide to go make pens off pen kits. If you're using a Bic, you can skip that particular step and just make it a thickness that makes you happy. To do the flattening, I'm just really using two acrylic blocks. I think the bottom one is one that I got off Amazon to put stamps on, and the top one is actually a lentil bead maker, but you can use anything. I like the clear ones because I like to be able to see what I'm doing, but you don't even have to use that. You could use anything flat. You could use a baking tile. Don't use your hands because your hands have variations and are lumpy and bumpy. And you really want a barrel that's as smooth as possible to minimize any extra sanding and to make your final pen feel as great as possible. Once you're happy with your width, trim the ends before proceeding. You'll need to do this again, but it's nice to start with a clean set of ends. When laying the cane slices on your pen barrel, one of the things I like to do is actually to cut up my original cane and use sections from many different areas from it. That way I have a lot of variation in my slices. Usually when you make a cane, you just take one part of it and reduce it down. And you could do that here too, but I think it would have too much similarity. Also while you're doing this to add more variation, stretch, bend, squish, distort, 
You can even only take partial slices. It'll all work out. I'm taking care each time I put a piece on to flatten it to as close to the level of the underlying clay as possible. This helps prevent pieces from distorting additionally when other pieces are near them or on them. Another advantage to this, it doesn't matter if your slices are all of uniform thickness or even if an individual slice is of uniform thickness because it'll all just squish away. It's okay to let some slices overlap but just realize that translucent on translucent does start becoming less translucent. I like to allow some slices to come off the end of the barrel. I think it looks better. This also takes a while, so we'll skip ahead again. Add slices until you're happy how it looks. You can see here I'm using another partial slice. When you're done, you're going to want to roll it flat again, this time really well, because you won't have another chance at it. With the pen, you can't really sand down divots or bumps. It all has to be pretty uniform thickness to begin with because it's such a precise object. And here, too much sanding and you would actually lose all of those brush strokes because they're just laid on the top and pretty thin. You can always do one last check for the thickness if you're using a pen kit. Check your ends. When you handle a pen, it can be easy for the pads of your fingers to be squishing those ends in too much, and then it won't actually join with the rest of the pen hardware very well. I like to squish them back out. When I'm flattening it, I flip from side to side because I figure my hand is probably not putting even pressure on both sides, and this reduces the chance that one side is going to be a lot thinner than the other. When you're done your final round of flattening, don't touch again until it's baked. You don't want to add any fingerprints to that. This is my pen baking setup, although this is not this pen, it's a different one. In fact, it'll be the one in my Bic Pen tutorial. 
I like to bake my pen barrels in a notched baking pan like you see here. I cover it to reduce scorching. And check for any nearby animals. Don't bake the cat. I hope you enjoyed this and I hope you'll make many awesome brush strokes. Please visit my channel Motley Woods for more cane and pen making videos. Thanks for watching and don't forget to like, subscribe, and comment. Comment below with what color brush strokes you would make if you built the cane for yourself or if you have any other ideas for projects using this cane. Thanks so much for watching. I hope you enjoyed it.